dadurch, dass Leica schon so über 150 Jahre Optikentwicklung macht, haben wir natürlich einen enormen Schatz an Know-how. Aus dem Vergleich gestern und technologische Möglichkeiten heute kann man dann eben den nächsten Schritt der Evolution wählen. Mein Name ist Peter Kabe, ich arbeite bei der Leica Kamera in der Entwicklung Optik. Wir entwickeln hauptsächlich Objektive für unsere Kamerasysteme. Das M-System in seiner jetzigen Form gibt es seit 1954, da ist die M3 eingeführt worden. Die M-Kamera ist eine Verpflichtung für uns. Also das, was 1954 hier entwickelt worden ist, hat sich dann immer wieder weiterentwickelt, aber immer mit dem Ziel, dass sich die Kamera nicht wesentlich gegenüber dem, was die M3 darstellt, unterscheidet. Leica hat immer zu dem M-System gestanden und wir haben die Digitalisierung dem M-System angepasst und nicht andersrum. Die Tradition bedingt, dass wir vier verschiedene Anforderungen an ein optisches System haben. Kompaktheit, Lichtstärke, Abbildungsleistung und Robustheit. Diese vier Merkmale sollen in einem M-Objektiv vereint werden. Und wir haben uns eben dem Ziel verschrieben, immer beste Leistung zu erzielen mit minimalem Einsatz von Linsen. Perfektion bei Objektiven heißt ja nicht nur, dass man im Design schöne MTF-Kurven hat, schöne Aberrationskorrektur, sondern das heißt auch immer, dass in der Fertigung viel Aufwand betrieben werden muss, damit diese Perfektion dann auch zum Kunden gelangt. Objektivbau ist an und für sich eine Handwerkskunst und es gehört viel Geschick und Talent auch dazu und Verständnis für das Material, was man einsetzt. All diese Vorgänge sind sehr abhängig davon, wer das macht und deshalb sind wir sehr stolz darauf, was unsere Kolleginnen und Kollegen in der Montage alles umsetzen. Die M-Kamera als solches hat ein M-Bajonett, das seit mehr als 65 Jahren im Markt ist und man kann alte Objektive mit neuen Kameras verbinden oder neue Objektive mit alten Kameras. Die Langlebigkeit und Robustheit auf der einen Seite, die Rückwärtskompatibilität, aber auch das, was wir an Innovationen in dieses System hineinstecken, zeigt eben, dass wir ein System geschaffen haben, was die Tradition und die Zukunft verbindet. Die M-Kamera erzieht den Fotografen, so ähnlich wie wenn man versucht, mit einem Füller zu schreiben. Den Füller zu benutzen ist am Anfang nicht einfach, aber wenn man dann einmal gelernt hat, wie man mit dem Füller umgehen kann, dann möchte man gar nicht mehr anders. Und genauso ist es mit der M. Mit der M, die erzieht einen erstmal Fehler zu machen, seine Sehweise zu korrigieren, genauso wie der Füller die Schreibweise korrigiert. Und das spürt man hinterher in den Fotos dann auch. Wenn man sich so Aufnahmen wie Cartier-Bresson oder, oder andere Street-Fotografen aus, aus den 50er Jahren anschaut, da sieht man, wie lebendig die Bilder sind, weil sie sich mehr auf das Motiv konzentriert haben und das Fokussieren dann nebenher passierte. Und das ist durch eine M-Kamera, ich glaube, noch in besonderer Weise möglich. Und deswegen kommen ja auch so schöne Fotos dabei raus. My name is Luigi Chiurchi. I am an Italian photographer and uh, director from uh, Genoa. I am 27 years old and uh, I have been using Leica cameras for uh, about five years now. My passion for photography can be traced back to when I was a kid. I remember when I was working in my father's photography shop and I was often uh, enchanted uh, by a poster with the entire Leica family tree. Yet I did not realize that uh, this was my path that uh, this would later change my life. My first camera from the Leica world was a Leica Cool, and uh, I then uh, switched to the SL system. SL2S trained me since the very beginning. I often work outdoors and while walking I need a powerful but uh, at the same time lightweight equipment. The two new Samicron lenses are uh, incredible because they weigh only half of the Apple lenses. 
The 35 and the 50 millimeters focal lens fit perfectly my travels because they allow me to have two very light but simultaneously super performing lenses. When I shoot a video I prefer fixed lens because they allow me to have more brightness and blur in the scenes, giving me a constant quality over the entire dynamic range. Leica is one of the major camera producers in history. Its manufacturer are unique and approaching the Leica world is an incredible experience. We could say that Leica is a way of life, or at least it is for me. Hello and welcome everyone to today's Leica Tech Talk, the art and science of APO lenses. My name is John Kreidler. I'm your host today, product specialist for Leica Camera USA. And before I'm joined with uh, by my co-host, uh, just a few things, uh, housekeeping items uh, I'd like to go over. So please uh, use the chat function and let us know where you're tuning in from. It's always great to, to see who's watching uh, live uh, as well as where where you're uh, viewing from. And then if you do have questions for us today during the course of the program, please use the Q&A function and we'll be sure to answer uh, all your questions as they come in. So uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host today, Nathan Kellum, Product Communication Specialist for Leica Camera. Good afternoon, Nathan. How are you doing, John? Always good to see you. Uh, it's great to be with you, and this will be, I know, a topic that we both really enjoy talking about, lenses and lens rendering. Uh, we even sneak in some MTF geekage, uh, so it's sure to be pretty exciting. So should we just dive into the, the PowerPoint and get, get on with things? So why don't you kick us off with describing what is APO? Yes, um, Apple for Leica means that the lens has an apochromatic design. Um, and what that means is that when you look at typical lenses, you want all of the wavelengths of light to hit the same focus points. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. It's actually relatively complicated to make that happen. Um, this is exactly what we try to do with the apochromatic lenses. We take every single wavelength of light that we can see and we try to align it at the focus point so that there's no any kind of color shift or contrast shift in the image. Um, you now, you might have seen lenses that are not apochromatic that when you're taking a picture and you know photographing something that is high contrast, maybe some metal and sunlight, for example, you're going to see some what's called chromatic aberration. And chromatic aberration is when you have that little purple or green fringing on the edges of your subject. Aprochromatic designs alleviate all that and provide a very clean image. On top of that, because we're focusing all the wavelengths of light into that single point, we're going to get a lot better color accuracy and a lot better sharpness as well. So there's a lot of advantages that we're going to talk about today with these lenses, but these are some of the best lenses that Leica has ever made. We have a number of them in a couple of different systems, including the M system and the SL system. So you can see right here, here are our apochromatic lenses uh, in the M system and the SL system. Uh, the M system are, is nice and small. The SL system has autofocus and weather sealing as well as zoom lenses. A lot of different advantages depending on what system you decide to choose with. So we're going to look at the history a little bit here of uh, our Apple chromatic design lenses, starting off with the 135 and the 90. These are both going to be um, lenses that are going to be in the telephoto range. And as light uh, you know, enters the lens straight through that lens, it's, it's a lot easier to make an aprochromatic design with these telephoto lenses. And something to consider is that when these lenses came out, this was during the film days. We haven't uh, released our first digital camera quite yet. And yet we are already thinking about perfecting these optical designs. 
Soon after, in 2005, we released the 75 millimeter APO lens. And the 75 was just right before the launch of the M8, uh, which was our first uh, digital system with the M system here. And, you know, when we think about Leica lenses, you know, a lot of times we talk about future proofing and this idea of keeping your lens for as long as possible despite changing out the bodies. And, you know, this system right here, this lens right here, the 75, again, was right before the digital age. And Leica knew that they were going to release a digital camera someday in the 2000s. And you will see that as we uh, go through the timeline right here, we're simply uh, offering different focal lengths and going wider and wider and wider. Um, and as many of you know, it's very challenging to make uh, aprochromatic designs, especially with wide angle lenses. You know, unlike telephoto lens where the light is going pretty straight into the lens, with wide angle lenses, light is coming from the edges right here. So we have the 50 in 2013, um, and uh, this coincides very much with the release of the uh, M9 monochrome. We, the Leica needed a lens that could match up to the sensitivity of the monochrome sensors and the 50 was an answer to that. And today we have the, the 2021 35 APO, again, going wider and wider and wider as we release these lenses. Um, and this really showcases the engineering prowess, in my opinion, of uh, these Leica designs. Uh, not only are we making a wide-angle lens with a 35 millimeter, but we are also um, having close focus abilities. Something to remember with Leica lenses, when it says APO on that lens, what it actually means is that it's aprochromatic at any aperture, at any focusing distance. So with the 35 being uh, having the ability to, to close focus, we are also having aprochromatic corrections at those very short distances as well. And that's quite an achievement. Next, let's talk a little bit about the SL range. The first aprochromatic design on the SL lens uh, range was in 2016. Um, and there was just a couple months after the release of the SL1. This is one of my favorite aprochromatic lenses that Leica offers. The range of 9280 is really nice for a lot of different applications, including landscapes. And we'll show some examples of that. And following the, the release of uh, you know, the M lenses, we are also doing that same kind of thing with the SLs, right? So we start off with the 90 and the 75, and then slowly venture it over to the 50, and then the 35, and then the 28. All of these SL lenses are the same barrel and the same filter size. So not, uh, you know, it's already somewhat complicated to make these uh, uh, aprochromatic designs, but on top of that, fitting these uh, different focal lengths and uh, these high tolerance optics into the same barrel and same filter size is for me one of the, the greatest achievements that we've had so far in our lens lineup. That's right, Nathan. And you know, the other thing I would add uh, to that is the close focus on all these lenses represent uh, basically the same, uh, I guess, aspect ratio of one to five. Uh, so no matter what lens you shoot, 28, 35, 50, 75, or 90, compositionally at close focus, you would have the same subject framed the same way. And the only thing that changes is the uh, you know the aspect of focal length and how that modifies or changes the subject uh, with more or less compression. So these are truly engineering uh, marvels and a lot of fun to shoot. And we'll we'll show uh, we'll show some images coming up. Uh, so let's uh, first we'll, we'll take a look at uh, color as a characteristic. So basically uh, what we're going to look at is color uh, and contrast and sharpness, as well as then uh, some of the artistic applications uh, for these lenses. So uh, as Nathan had mentioned, when we talk about chromatic aberration, we're looking at usually a highly reflected um, metal metallic surface where we're, you would see a separation of color. And here on the bike, you can see kind of that purple um, outline. And that's what we're talking about. And that, for most photographers, is something that we don't 
want to see uh, in our photograph. So we'll take a look at uh, at some shots here. So this, uh, of course, with Nathan's favorite lens, one of Nathan's uh, images. And uh, what I find striking about this is that we see uh, a beautiful blue sky, uh, the red of the strawberry and bright direct light, but we're also seeing green and we're not seeing any color contamination. One isn't, uh, you know, let's say bleeding over into the next and the skin tone is very natural. So Nathan, uh, tell us a little bit maybe about, about this image, where it was taken and what were the kind of the circumstances? Yeah, this was shot with the Leica M11, and you're right, it's one of my favorite lenses, the 135. Um, and, you know, what was really striking with this particular photograph is the color accuracy. We're going to talk a lot about this during, you know, our, our conversation today. But when I look at that red of that strawberry in, you know, direct sunlight, that is exactly the shade of red that it should be. It's not... Uh, on a blue side, it's not orange, it's not yellow. It's really that that deep red um, of, that a strawberry should have. And you know, having all these primary colors together, I think is a, is a good example of the performance of this lens. Um, and this was shot wide open uh, with that again with that one thirty five. Um, you know, and when we talk about color accuracy, there's you know a couple of different ways we can talk about this. But the way I like to describe it is, the the difference in you know the shades and and luminosity values uh and so if you if you use the the white balance for example if you took this image into lightroom into photoshop and you move the white balance around the difference between all these colors would remain the same right the, the red would not also be more saturated than the blue than the green and this is really important because there are a lot of photographers that do edit their images and when they do make these changes or these shifts um, you wouldn't want the uh, the colors to all of a sudden change as far as their density to one another. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of printing in some ways where when you're printing onto a certain type of paper or you're utilizing a certain type of, you know, printer or ink, um, there are different ways to make sure that the color still works with the medium that you're using. And at the end of the day, these apochromatic lenses or apochromatic designs um, are are designed to provide the user with the most and the most uh, the most information and the most clarity when it comes to that information as well. So it's a very uh, in, you know there's a, a tremendous amount of data being transferred from these lenses into the sensor as far as that accuracy, the density, uh, and also the the lights. We'll talk a little bit about you know how um, contrast plays a lot into these images as we as we look through these. Here's another example with the the 135. You know, as some of you know, the shade of red is is relatively hard to capture, especially with digital sensors. And I was really impressed by the reds of the M11. But it starts with the lens. The lens is able to differentiate all of these shades of red very very clearly. And if we look on the top part of the image, we have this little bird perched up on the boat here, and you can see that there is no chromatic aberration on that net behind the bird, despite it being, uh, you know, the light coming from behind the bird and uh, being on the far corners of the frame. Performance of these lenses are, is not only exquisite in the center, but also on the edges. Because if you're like me, you like to fit, if you have to fit uh, your subjects on the edges of your frame, you're still going to get that performance. Right. It's, it's always about filling the frame, right? <laughs> and, and good composition. And I think uh, lenses that render this way, uh, that's certainly very helpful, but great composition uh, and being able to use a lens and take advantage of the entire real estate of the sensor uh, is very important to a lot of photographers. Um, so here in, um, in, in Dumbo with the 75 uh, aposumicron, and what strikes me really is looking at the Freedom Tower and seeing all the shades of blue, uh, you know, that are being reflected from uh, from from the sky. Probably some from an adjacent building, some maybe from the water, and uh, just the amount of detail and clarity that you see uh, in these images. So, uh, the seventy five is a focal length that I've always enjoyed shooting, um, and I it's that lens is for me is very special because of its 
its size and focal length. I find it very useful for all kinds of uh, photography. Um, this I find interesting. And uh, Nathan, why don't you take us through it? I mean, it's interesting because this is now mixed light. And we know a lot of times when you have a mixed lighting uh, for any camera lens combination, it's going to be tricky. Uh, but we're seeing some very interesting things here. Why don't you take us through it? Yes, this was uh, shot in, in Wetzlar, Germany, uh, where our, our Leica's factory resides. And uh, we were displaying uh, one of uh, the uh, Oscar Barnack 105 cameras that uh, was sold at an auction um, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, actually. And uh, like you said, John, we are working with mixed light. So on the right-hand side of the camera, on the left-hand side for us, there is a, a window and there is, you know, there was blue sky that day. And then above the camera itself, there is some other lighting. I'm not quite, I don't quite remember exactly what it was, but it definitely wasn't uh, daylight, natural light. And so, you know, with um, these Afrochromatic designs, the precision of color is very, very high. You can see that we have this transition uh, on the table here where it starts off blue, that reflection of the blue skies is seen. And as you uh, guide your eyes to the right of the table, you can see that the the internal lights of the room kind of take over and it becomes a little more on the yellow side. And you know, you can see that as well on the on the glove on the right hand side of this image here, where you know that blue light is bouncing onto the bottom part of the glove, but where the thumb and index is, we get that yellow tonality from that light inside uh, of, of this room here. And it's it's done very naturally. The transition is done very naturally that you can tell where light is bouncing and on what surface is bouncing out, even on the leather of the camera. I love that you can see kind of that reflection of that blue of the sky from the window. It's really a, a precise tool to um, showcase everything that's happening inside your frame. All that light that's bouncing around, uh, it's, you know, it's physics, right? The lens can actually see all this. And so having that kind of precision uh, can be extremely helpful um, in, in these kinds of situations, but I can also imagine this being used for you know more business applications. If you're doing product photography, for example, and the color of the the garment needs to be exactly this particular shade of this particular color, um, these lenses will really excel in those environments. Yeah, there's there's something about uh, I guess Miami and the sky and how and how blue it is and uh being able to shoot the uh the aposumicron m35 uh i think for the first time uh when i was in miami i was struck by how uh that lens renders um color and how it renders the sky and the close focus capability of the lens uh it's a lot of fun and uh unfortunately it's been kind of hard to get uh although recently i think uh, we're doing a little better shipping them, but uh, for me, you know, seeing the sky and then the reflections of light within uh, of the windows uh, and the color of the building, it's um, it's just extraordinary uh, what what that lens can produce. Uh, here, another example, kind of showing a little bit of the art or the bokeh uh, of a lens that transition where we have uh, a very sharp. Uh, uh, plane of focus uh, that's really heightened. And I would say, and Nathan, it would be good to get your opinion on this, but for me, this lens wide open renders very similar to a Sumalux. Uh, mm. And we're seeing that transition and we're seeing kind of that, uh, what I like to call the the uh, the creamy sharpness of, of the bokeh. It's just a uh, very smooth, and uh, elegant cinematic uh, is probably what you would say. Uh, and I, I just think, um, you know, an example like this, okay, of what I guess is uh, fungus on bark, uh, probably in the woods in Germany somewhere, one of our colleagues took this. Um, it, it, to me, it's, it just really shows the rendering characteristics of the lens. Yeah, I know. I think it comes back to, you know, what we're going to talk about in just a moment, which is the contrast, right? And, you know, these mm -hmm. aprochromatic lens designs are, are really exquisite when it comes to controlling that contrast. You know, the contrast at the point of focus here is at its maximum. And as the depth of field, you know, you can as, as you can see that bokeh, as you can see those uh, those mushrooms behind 
that that main mushroom subject there, the contrast is starting to drop and to drop and to drop. And so it makes it look like, just like you said, that it's a lens with a faster aperture uh, because that contrast drops so dramatically right after that point of focus. And this is definitely a property of uh, not only um, you know the SL lenses that many of you have shot already, but specifically the APO designs. You know that contrast and the control of contrast is something that's a priority for Leica when it comes to building out these lenses. This is a great example, as I love this shot. Yeah, yeah. it's um, obviously a little bit of action going on, grinding metal, uh, sparks flying, uh, but the, the color stays true. And even though it, like in a workshop uh, environment, the, the lighting certainly isn't color corrected. And in this case, it doesn't even look like it may be safe, uh, although it could just be for the drama of the shot. But even looking at the back wall, you're not seeing a cast uh, to the color. You're looking at the skin tones, very natural. Um, and uh, again, just another great example of color accuracy uh, in particularly in uh, a low light, low light situation. And now, Nathan, this is one of your shots. Um, it looks like a quail. And what, yes. what strikes me <laughs> is is the uh, the catch light. And again, that heightened uh, contrast that really, you know, with the 90 to 280, getting that compression, making the background just uh, melt uh, into uh, creamy nothingness of color. Uh, and yet seeing the detail on the quail, it's it's uh, amazing. And a low light, and a low light situation, yes. great color. That's, where, I think that's was the this, key uh, things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this was shot at, at the, the Woodland Park Zoo here in Seattle, Washington. And I'm glad you mentioned the low light because, you know, low light is usually when uh, the the contrast, you know, you, you want a little bit more contrast in low light. Usually it's a non-contrasting environment. And because of that contrast control that we've been talking about with these lenses, even low, low light, you get that beautiful separation, not only behind the subject, which like you said, just melts away that background, but also in front of the subjects, which really amplifies that depth out of that image, that 3D quality that a lot of our customers like to talk about and, and shoot. Um, you know, having the ability to really uh, utilize the foreground as a compositional element and not distract the viewer from the main subject, I think is a, is a wonderful property of these of these uh, apochromatic designs, but specifically with this lens where you have that compression, you have the ability to zoom in and to work with different layers within the frame. This is another example here in Seattle where you know utilizing the compression of that lens, we have the city of Seattle, and then behind it, we have Mount Rainier, which is many miles away from the city. And using the compression of a lens, we can bring those two subjects together into one frame. But one of the things that really struck me with this image here is we're seeing the light from the city, right? This these kind of this yellowish tone, this orangish tone coming from the buildings, from the insides of the buildings, from the light from the Space Needle. And at the same time, we have the light of the natural light of, of a sunset of that day. And when those two you know, light sources kind of collide, you know, you'd think that there's be, there'd be this kind of, uh, you know, harsh, harshness to it, right? But no, it's very, it's very soft. It's very uh, natural looking. Um, you can see very clearly where the light from the sunset is coming, and you can see very clearly the light from the city as well. And that combination and that control of color is again, a specialty of these lenses. Another shot with the 9280. That uh, that orange red coat just pops off the screen. Uh, I mean, you can. One of the cool things about these lenses, because these lenses can accurately record these values, you can utilize uh, that ability to really frame your images. You know, right now the image was framed using the the this kind of wooden fence area, um, but you know your eye is directly drawn to that red coat and you know it works really well from a compositional standpoint as well. Yeah, I, li I like this because this lens, yeah, landscape. another landscape with 
90 to 280. Uh, again, a, an application a lot of people don't really consider, but it's um, and it also for street. It's great for obviously for compression, but just uh, the delicate tones yet details even in the the uh, you know the tree the tree line. Uh, there's plenty of detail there. So uh, again, just another great great example of how these lenses render uh, color and produce uh, contrast. Um, this uh, again in uh, in Miami, just an old sign on a building, but the camera's ability or the lens's ability to really render uh, this color correctly and the patina, um, it's just, um, and again, incredibly, incredibly sharp and just uh, a really fun lens uh, to shoot again, even in street. Um, and Nathan, this, I guess this is your daily, <laughs> your daily driver, right? This Ferrari. I, I just is... take this one when I go grocery shopping and then I have the others for okay. the other stuff, you know? <laughs> right. Makes sense. No, a... You don't want to put too many miles on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Though this is, uh, we had the opportunity to shoot, uh, some, some very nice cars, uh, when this lens came out. And, uh, this was an image where when I took, uh, you know, a couple shots of this car, I was just, I really truly understood that the next level qualities of these lenses, um, you know, even wide open, you just get this incredible performance. We were talking with uh, our teammates in Germany and the goal for these SL hypochromatic uh, prime lenses is that the lenses wide open cover at minimum 100 megapixels. Most of them will cover much more than that, but at minimum 100 megapixels. And you know, as as technology marches on and as uh, you know, cameras come out with more and more megapixels, these lenses will be able to perform on those new sensors. So, really, the idea of longevity, the idea of you know having a lens that you keep for a very very long time while shooting wide open. Of course, if you stop down, you're going to get even better performance. But these lenses are really just next level when it comes to the resolution that they offer uh, at at the lowest aperture value. Yeah, future proof is a big thing for us. Um, you know, it's it's very important. Um, and here, uh, another example with the ninety. Uh, again, the amount of detail, color accuracy. Um, it's just, it's just beautiful. I, you know, again, ninety. A lot of times, people say a portrait, you know, portrait focal length only, but you know. Try try shooting some landscapes with telephoto. Yeah, what, and I what do you like really, particularly about about this image? I well, there's a, there's a couple of different things, but one thing that kind of jumped out uh, when I was editing this file is, you know, this lens has a really interesting, you know, the, the precision of this lens is very very high, and what I mean by this is that you can really see the atmospheric perspective uh, in this shot, right? You have the the trees in the foreground. And as your eye kind of guides to, in this case, Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier is extremely sharp, but there is this atmosphere because it's so far away from me um, that is visible, you know? And, and mm. I, I like the fact that this lens is really capturing, again, the reality of the scene, you know, because atmospheric perspective is a real thing. And, you know, this, the, even though I'm focusing on the mountain itself, uh, the mountain is far away, and so you're going to have a little bit of haze. You're going to have a little bit of this and that, uh, just because that's naturally how you know it's what's what's actually going on here. And so the realism, I think, with these lenses is really something that struck me, whether it be for landscapes or for portraiture. Um, you know, it, it speaks to the precision of the contrast. It, it speaks to the precision of the colors. It speaks to the resolution that these lenses uh, mm -hmm. offer every single person. Yeah, this was, uh, they're getting the band back together in uh, Washington Square Park. And uh, again, with the 90, uh, doing some street photography, uh, for me, um, I was really struck cropping in and looking at this image and seeing how the light and color from the umbrella isn't affecting skin tone and how it's, the costume, the colors are still very on and not contaminated by uh, this light. And then looking at, again, kind of what I call 
again, the creamy sharpness or the uh, the cinematic look of the bokeh. Uh, it's just how it kind of melts away and allows the subject to really stand out. It's um, again, these are all things that apochromatically designed lenses are designed to render this way. And I feel shooting these lenses definitely elevates my photography. Um, you know, and you still have to understand composition and you still have to, you know, realize there's stories to be told, but concentrating on color. And then when you go in and edit and have to wrestle with color contamination or color shifts in mix lighting or with other influences, it's, it's a lot more work and it doesn't make editing quite as fun. I don't know how you feel about it, Nathan, but well, I know what's interesting I... <laughs> about this image is what we kind of talked about at first with the 35 shot where that contrast, right? So you, you mm -hmm. know, it's perfectly sharp on the subject, but then the contrast drops very dramatically. And, you know, when you were first showing right. me this image, I wasn't aware of what lens you were using. This looks like, you know, a 75 not deluxe. It looks like a lens that has a much wider aperture than, uh, right. than F2. And, and I think that there's, a real advantage to to having that because you have the the form factor of a 90 f2 for this sl lens but you get the right. performance of what should be a much larger and more complicated lens and so you know it's it's you kind of get the best of both worlds in some cases where you get you know this incredible sh i mean cropped in here I, I would say this is what a 135 or something to that effect you can really with our it's high megapixel yeah. sensors yeah. kind of get away with, you know, going in and, and making it look like it's not at all the lens that you shot it with. And so there's so many advantages, especially for these kind of street situations where maybe you don't want to get too close to your subjects without, you know, to not disturb them, but you just get this incredible performance once you're back home looking at these files on a really big screen. Yeah, this, uh, this butterfly, I was, I, I probably shot, I don't know, probably way too many images just trying to get exactly what I wanted and and zooming in just being able to pick up the texture uh, and color and how everything is isolated again with the the heightened contrast uh, and giving that look even shooting an f2 like a 1.4 again um, and just not seeing color contamination from everything in the background that would cause um, cause problems with other cameras and other lenses where everything would cast um, like a background color, like green. Uh, so to me, um, again, it's just another, another example of um, its, its ability and being able to focus in fairly close. I mean, I, I think I was maybe a foot and a half away, um, you know, from the butterfly. It, it's uh, again, giving you opportunities to create images uh, that these lenses do that other lenses just don't don't allow. Same here with uh, with the fifty, and to me, I just love the way this shows um, the rendering characteristics beyond uh, the point of focus and how again very cinematic. Again, the creamy sharpness of of the bokeh going from this heightened point of focus, very shallow uh, depth of field, and then going to almost uh, a mush of color, uh, but you can still kind of understand what's what's in the background. And right. um, again, it's it's just one a, a lens that that gives you these opportunities to produce um, images uh, this way. So um, this uh, a funny. Well, I think it's funny. Uh, maybe some people will also find it funny. This I took uh, during a Phil Penman workshop. Uh, so not all of us shoot black and white with Phil Penman. Um, and I, I think now um, I'm not sure you can even take this image anymore because of how uh, this part of uh, in two bridges where it's kind of barricaded, where they're uh, rebuilding um, part of the, I guess, the walk or the bridge or some area for public safety. Um, but uh, again, it was just one of those beautiful sunrises and uh you know with phil we got to this place probably an hour before 
uh, sun up and we had already been walking probably an hour. So um, you definitely get your steps in. Um, and Nathan, what, what do you, what strikes you about this, this image? I, I mean, for me, it's the color, uh, but I, you know, it's just, again, being in position ahead of time before sun up. Um, but I think you had some interesting comments, I think earlier today when we were going through some images yeah, I, I, you know, I think this, you know, speaks to if you are, you know, the type of person that likes to get up early for those sunrise shots, you, you start to understand, you start to uh, see, you know, how the light bounces uh, around your subject, in this case, you know, a cityscape mm -hmm. or a landscape, uh, you know, right before the sun actually passes the horizon, there's this kind of very beautiful time, right, where the light is just starting to creep in onto your scene. And I think that this is, for me, exactly the colors that you see right before the sun peeks through those buildings on the horizon line there. You know, you still have the blue of uh, the sky on the top part of your image right. that's not quite illuminated quite yet by that orange-yellow glow of the sun. And, you know, of course, this is probably like 10 seconds later that all that disappeared. But there is that moment, right, where... Yeah. It, that transition hasn't quite happened yet. And these that's an excellent time to push that shutter, to, to take an image, because you're getting this beautiful selection of blues and purples that still have the yellows and oranges that we love to see as the sun starts to, to, to creep up right. again on that horizon line. Um, so for me, it's a, a, a great example of, of accuracy, but in a very kind of stressful environment from a lighting perspective, right? Where there's just so right. much saturation, so much intensity coming from that horizon line. And yet the lens deals with it with no problem. You know, it's it's one of those yeah. things that is still impresses me today, especially in those intense, uh, challenging lighting situations. Yeah, this uh, also in New York, in uh, Chinatown, there's a skate park. And um, just uh, the color of graffiti and the reflection in early morning and just how the color, again, the color renders uh, very realistically. And a lot of times early morning, I like to shoot uh, reflections quite a bit, whether it's buildings or, um, you know, like this where there was, uh, I guess it had rained and there's plenty of water in the kind of in the bottom of the uh, some of the areas in the uh, in the skate park, so it always creates an interesting uh, environment to to uh, to shoot in and great great color. Um, so this is one of your shots, and I really, again, it's a great example of uh, sunset, which some would say would be the lazy man sunrise. Uh, I wouldn't say that, but some some would. Um, so, uh, I mean, you're, you're looking at uh, I, I just great color and how it replicates uh, and how it influences some things, but not not everything. Why don't you take us through this um, this image? You're right. So this this in, indeed was sunset. Um, and, you know, the sun is in the shot. It's on that top part of, of the image there. And, you know, I was uh, photographing my friend. Uh, on the beach. And, you know, I was really surprised as I was looking at these images on my screen after the fact that there's no color shift on her skin. There's no color mm -hmm. shift on the clothes that she's wearing, you know, that that red and the blue and the yellow um, still pops, you know, and is, a, is a, I feel like a great example of someone who, if you were the type of person that did fashion photography in, in natural lights, you know, you could utilize this lens in these kind of sunset environments where there should be a little bit of shift, but, um, you know, the, the skin tones and, and the subject matter uh, as far as accuracy uh, stays intact. Um, you know, I, one of the things yeah. I love is as the sun was going down, you know, you get a little bit of that hair light, right? And just the, the, mm -hmm. the top of my subject's head here is, almost completely yellow just because you know that that sun is hitting that subject just right there but then you see that transition between the top of the head down to uh you know the sides of her head where her ear is and the the um the brown hair that she has is is perfectly rendered uh, right there in the shadows right so there's 
it's just yeah. a, again the, the color accuracy and the precision of these lenses even in these challenging lighting situations continues to amaze me and i really love taking these lens out in these kind of in these environments you know these sunset sunrise environments but i can also see with people using this in the studio and getting incredible results yeah no it's uh that's one lens that uh, mark topalo likes to use quite a bit and it's be just for those reasons where uh the color is is very accurate no matter uh the lighting situation and here with uh another one of your shots really muted color yet detail in the foreground uh, yeah, so why don't you was, take us through that a little bit a, a couple minutes actually after that previous <clears throat> shot and uh mm. you know we have these beautiful pastel colors in the sky reflected onto the water uh, and yet we do have that just beautiful kind of dense green forest color as well on the top left of, of the image. And, you know, if you were the type of person that wanted to make some adjustments to this particular image via the white balance, maybe make it a little bit warm or a little bit colder, um, the accuracy of all these tones will allow you to shift all these colors all at the same time without, you know, without any issues uh, that that green would uh, would still be kind of a, a dense green, no matter um, if you shift the, to the to the yellows or, or to the blues. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it just allows you to to have a lot of control. You know, if you if you like to yeah. leave the image as it is in this kind of natural rendition, you know, you can definitely do that. But if you're the type of person that likes to push the files, um, these lenses will allow you to do that just because it's delivering again so much information and so much accuracy to the sensor. Yeah, this uh, in New York, uh, just the you know graffiti, and what struck me with the twenty eight is again, it's not only its close focus capabilities, but the amount of detail. I mean, you can also you know, almost see the you know the spray, <laughs> the spray marks on it. I mean, it, it's uh, and the color, the rendering is again on point. So, um, just again a. a these lenses are really rendering uh, beyond beyond the sensor and with very accurate accurate color. Uh, here again with the twenty eight uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge, and just showing the uh, the isolation kind of pointing to the close focus capability of that lens uh, with a lot of detail on this um, uh, call box or utility box. Yet seeing kind of the the bokeh, the the lights in the um, in the distance. Uh, yeah, you can see the yellow taxi cab and how all the light, uh, the color. Each color is separate. It's it's not. There's no overall cast to it, and that's by virtue of uh, the uh, apochromatic nature of uh, of the lens. Um, it's uh, they're just you know fun to shoot and to challenge the lenses and. Um, you know, I, I've tried, and I'm sure Nathan, you've tried, uh, you know, to create flair with these lenses, like an M lens, and it's, yeah, I, I've not been able to do it. Even you know, no hood. A lot of times, I don't shoot with hoods. Um, yeah. I, because I, I, I get partly because I don't think there's a need to. Um, but uh, again, it's 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 uh, it, it's fun to push uh, or. Uh, as uh, Mark DiPaolo always says, wring the neck of the lens to get everything out of it and really understand it. Um, but all the, the Apple Supercron lenses in general, it's a lot of fun because pretty much no matter how you use it, how you shoot it, you're going to get perfect color, great sharpness, um, and it's by design. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. To, so, to speak about oh, that previous ahead. shot there that I really love, uh, right. John, that you shot here is... Uh, the quality of the bokeh, you know, you have yeah. these beautiful round bokeh of the city behind, you know, the bridge there and all the way to the edge, that bokeh is round and smooth. And I think that, yeah. you know, there's a, a lot of qualities that we've talked about for these, uh, you know, apochromatic designs, you know, color and contrast and, and this the resolution, but other optical attributes such as, you know, what we're talking about right now with the bokeh, I think it's also important. You know, there's this is also something right. that Leica thinks about 
And, you know, that idea, you know, the way I describe it is cinematic, you know, it's, it's just, it has mm -hmm. this beautiful storytelling feel to it, um, where I, I could see this being a frame from a movie very, very easily. So I, I love the fact that, you know, Leica really tries to consider, you know, all attributes of the image, not just the main ones that we think about. And that includes right. Boca in the background, but also Boca in the foreground and how that renders. Right. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah, no, and I, I, I think just another point to that is that when we design lenses, we're trying to design lenses that render as we see. Um, and then actually in apochromatic, um, I kind of feel they render better than I see. Uh, right. You know, they're <laughs> a lot of times they're sharper, uh, and the color is is more more accurate. But um, that's kind of one as we saw in the in the uh, intro video with Peter Carver, who was talking about M lenses and how they're designed and made. It's really we're designing lenses that render a specific way, and it's kind of how how we see. So it wouldn't be a tech talk without a little tech mixed in. So uh, we're going to talk for a minute or two about MTF charts. So in in general, uh, MTF charts are basically describing, uh, in a nutshell, a thumbnail version of how the lens itself renders. So for us, when we talk about an MTF chart, we have uh, two sets of four four lines. Uh, those lines are uh, basically rating contrast. Uh, and we're looking at at, zero, at the zero, zero point is the center point of the sensor. And then 21 is the edge of the sensor. And then on the vertical line, it's percentage of contrast. So we have uh, four lines or eight lines, actually, uh, but they're consistent of five line pairs, 10, 20, and 40 line pairs. So if we look at um, here on the right where we see those bars, essentially a line pair is a black line next to a white line. And if you can see or count all the line pairs, that's 100% contrast. If it looks like on the right, like a, a block of gray, that is zero contrast. So here, if we look at uh, these three examples of different 50 millimeter lenses, all at f2, all at close focus, um, which would be consistent with the Leica look, where we're looking at lenses and how they render uh, at close focus and wide open, or in the Noctilux's case, almost wide open. And we can see that uh, the Noctilux, as you go to the edge, you get a lot more fall off uh, in contrast or a lot less sharp. Um, and that's the personality of that lens. When we go to the right and we're looking at the Apo Summicron SL lens, we can see that grouping is very tight. Uh, and then the M lens is kind of in the middle, closer to the SL. But what I find interesting is even at 40 line pairs, so the most, trying to render the most detail, at the edge of the frame, both the uh, the M and the SL lens are pretty close to the same rendering characteristic. It's just below 60% contrast, um, I don't know, maybe 58, 55% contrast, which is stunning if you think about the design constraints of an M lens because of its size, because of its amount, um, and because we've kept the same mount since 1954 and we adapted digital to it, um, where the SL much bigger, a lot more uh, freedom to, to create lenses and design lenses. Uh, but to me, when I'm looking at the edge of it, what that indicates is it's going back to what I said earlier, where we're designing lenses that render as we see. So to have a lens that's perfectly sharp that renders 90 or 100% from center to edge, that image is not gonna look very three-dimensional. So we need some 
wiggle in the MTF charts. So that uh, hopefully wasn't uh, too boring or too confusing. Uh, so let's let's take a look at uh, some more uh, some more images here. Um, again, uh, here with uh, the 135. Uh, this is one of Nathan's shots, and to me, what's incredible about this is the uh, the amount of detail, and even at that distance and that magnification, and yet you're still seeing um, this gradation of of color and rendering. What had, what, what attracted you to to take this image? I mean, to me, it's oh. it's almost. I could have put it in the art section. It's uh, it really has that, you know, that feeling of uh, um, like an emotional rendering in a way. Like it, it it sets a mood, I guess, for me. Sure, I I um I think there's a couple reasons. This was shot from uh, the Mont Saint Michel in in France. You know, when you're up up in the the uh, that church up there in on the hill. And you look down and you're surrounded by the ocean. You're surrounded by currents. And um, there are a lot of people that walk around the Mont Michel to get to different places. And they just kind of take whatever road that they want to, and including going through parts of the ocean itself. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the, the lines in the shot. I love the different colors in the shots. We have shades of green and blue and, you know, light, you know, reflecting from the sky and, you know, the the... The sand as well is there as well, but you know what really struck me is that you got this these very small subjects in this big environment, and despite like you said being so far away from these subjects, as you zoom in, thanks to the sixty megapixel sensor on the M eleven, you can see people's individual backpack straps. You know when you zoom in, it's just absolutely incredible to to explore. Um, you know something that is so small and so far away. And with so much precision and and still also seeing those other qualities that we talked about with contrast and color accuracy. Um, mm -hmm. There's something for me very cinematic about this kind of, uh, you know, this trek that these people are going are doing to get to their final destination. And, uh, you know, you can see it, like those little details of people waiting and people adventuring on and, and things like that, that. I'm not sure other lenses would be able to correctly render, you know, because of this precision, we get a little bit more of that storytelling as you zoom in. Yeah. I think it's also impressive to remember that that lens was designed in, or came out in 1998, probably started right. designed in the mid nineties. Um, you know, we talk about free, uh, future proof. Um, you know, you even wonder when, uh, I don't know who who designed that. Whether it was still was it Peter Carva or was on the team or Dr. Mandler, you know, if they even thought that, you know, I always think that is, you know, the particularly with Dr. Mandler that had over five hundred lens patents, right? Is right? Did he think <laughs> in the year twenty twenty three that we would still be using uh, some of the lenses that he designed? Uh, yeah, you know, seventy-five and, sumo exam. I mean, it's 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 crazy to really reflect and and think on it. And then when you get to shoot them, shoot the lenses on the modern cameras, it's uh, really very impressive. Particularly the the uh, the early Apo Sumicron lenses. I I totally agree with you, John. I think that you know when you think about like you said when this lens came out, we're back in the film days, right? We're I'm sure, you know, like it was thinking about digital was becoming more and more of a thing, but I'm not sure they were thinking about 60 megapixels <laughs> and, and right. the advent right. of that right back in the in the late 90s. And, you know, it, it's, I think it speaks to the engineering and, and to, you know, uh, that idea of future proofing. We really want you to to buy the lens and, and purchase it once and uh, enjoy it for, for decades to come. Um, you know, when we talk about contrast, I think that it's really important to talk about the monochrome as well. You know, the Leica M11 mm -hmm. monochrome is such a fantastic camera with an amazing sensor. And, you know, we're not talking about color accuracy anymore. We're really talking about the shades of gray that the sensor can record. But for that to happen, the lens needs to be able to see those shades of gray. And that's where that idea of contrast and the contrast control really comes in. I mean, when you look at the details of this particular shot right here with the water droplets and, you know, the transition of light between the highlights 
and the shadows as you you know look at the at the tulip head here even you know the highlights and shadow transition in the water droplets themselves uh, is just mm -hmm. you know so precise you can even see if you look close little air bubbles inside those water droplets you know that's when you know that that lens is is still uh, you know, outperforming the sensor of the M11 monochrome is such a beautiful and incredible, incredible design. Yeah, I'm t I'm taken by the uh, the way it recorded the texture of the tulip. Yes, like it, you look at that, and it's it's you know it's so delicate. And uh, a lot of times, when you think of photographing flowers, color is the driver. Uh, so. You know, but here with this, it's it's really striking. It's uh, the monochrome sensor's ability and that lens to to really record this kind of delicate texture where color may bring it out differently, but you really, in monochrome, it's uh, very impressive. I, I agree with you. You can clearly see the, the delicacy. And, you know, these lenses, yeah. as we've, we've been speaking, you know, they're extremely sharp, but they're not they're not trying to overly sharpen subjects that are not sharp to begin with. You either, right. I feel a, a certain type of, I'm going to use the word maturity, I guess, with these lenses where, you know, if the subject is delicate, then that rendering, because we're, again, we're going for realism here, we're going for clarity here, uh, will be accurately represented. So that's definitely a great point. Right. Um, well, we've got a, a couple of questions, and I, I guess keep them keep the questions coming. Uh, I guess uh, one was about uh, I, I'm guessing the the uh, the portrait that you took, Nathan, at sunset. If you're using any kind of reflector uh, on that, or if it was all just natural natural oh. light, and maybe using water for <laughs> as a reflector or something. No, no reflectors on that shot. Um, this okay. was all with the dynamic range of the SL2. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I underexposed the image by at least a stop, most likely around two to get to make sure I had the highlights in the hair. Uh, but then uh -huh. you just bring all that back up and post. And, uh, you know, again, despite moving that image uh, into, you know, to pumping the exposure up a little bit higher in the in the editing process, Again, the color still remains, you know, as accurate as, as ever. So I think that, you know, it's really a testament not only to the sensor of the SL2, but also uh, the performance uh, of that lens once again. All right, great. All right, let's, uh, we'll go back to a couple more images here. Um, I think we've got a cup of coffee. That's kind of interesting. Yes, some and... latte art. <laughs> with the latte dragon and uh what which what strikes me is the again the lens's ability to pick up this the texture in the froth of the latte but also that again that transition that we keep talking about with the heightened contrast where it makes the tabletop look uh again like a creamy sea of color i mean it's it's uh it's pretty impressive uh that fall yet showing all that, uh, all that detail, the detail of the dragon, uh, and it's and it's froth, and you know the the color, and not mixing color because I'm, and even the edge of the cup, you know, going from the top to the bottom, how you, we have that that fall off, um, and that in terms of perspective is probably only millimeters different, yet we're right. seeing that that dimension, uh, which is really uh, I think really impressive. Uh, here, I guess you were photographing some uh, some Leica watches. Looks like yeah. Where was where was this? I mean, it's a really harsh lighting. You're really pushing the the attributes of the of that lens. Absolutely. So this was uh, in Vestlar. Um, they were uh, they had some um, some prototypes on display, and uh, like you said, this is direct sunlight on metal and very small pieces of metal. Um, this was in some ways a stress test for this lens. Yeah. And um, you know, as, as you zoom in, there's just no issues. You know, it's just so surprising how good this lens, you know, this good this lens is. Um, especially when you try to photograph something that small, that's usually when mm -hmm. 
start going to start to see, especially like, you know, gold and things like that, where there's, you know, right. a difference in contrast compared to the other types of metal on in that watch there. Um, you know, that's when you start to, it starts to creep in, right? That chromatic aberration. But uh, nope, the 50 is, uh, is up for the task. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, it, it's definitely, it's just, uh, it's yeah, it's, for me, it's definitely a chestnut. Um, you know, it's a, it's a lens that gave birth to a lot of other lenses. Um, and I think it's, you know, one of Peter Carver's, you know, crown jewels of, of lens design. Um, it's really um, an incredible, an incredible lens to, to, to shoot. Uh, and it never, it never disappoints. And considering how small and compact it is, uh, it's really quite amazing. Uh, here I is another shot. You. There's, you know, there's a couple of lenses in the Leica lineup that I feel will, you know, become legendary or are already yeah. legendary. And uh, yeah. the 50 APO is definitely one of them. The M version yeah. in particular is very special. Um, this is a shot with that lens as well with the monochrome 246. And um, again, speaking to the precision of the tones, uh, you know, the hair lights, you know, which just is just bar light with the pool table here. But, you know, you can clearly see how the light is bouncing around from the tip of the fingers all the way to the palm, you know, how the light is bouncing off the pool stick, you know, how light is bouncing off even darker environments like, or darker elements like uh, like the, um, uh, the, the sweater that uh, my friend Anna yeah. is wearing here. Um, you know, I think the, one of the reasons why the 50 APO was launched with the M9 monochrome is because there's really a, a demand for high performance when it comes to the world of optics with these sensors. And you, you can see here why, right? Because there's just so many shades of gray possible with these monochrome sensors. You want to be able to see all that. You want to be able to render all that even in the most challenging situ situations. And, uh, you know, as we've seen with these images here, this lens is definitely up to the task. Yeah, this is uh, Charlie. Uh, he was in Miami. And um, again, just that lens's ability to, to not only render color, but the amount of detail and sharpness. And it, it was uh, an overcast day, which um, I guess a lot of times it's like shooting in a giant softbox. But again, it's it can be difficult to get extreme detail. Uh, but here, there's uh, there's a lot of detail. Um, you know, same kind of here um, in this uh, three uh, three five six Porsche. Uh, again, the amount of detail, sharpness, clarity, color. We're not seeing any chromatic aberration. And um, this is uh, one of my favorite shots with that with that lens because of how the color rendered it was right you know right on the money and just uh gorgeous um yeah i love that it's shot. a lot of fun yeah and this um you know at a track day and what i was struck by is the red is very accurate but then seeing the reflection of the guardrail kind of in that highlight um and how it's separated uh mm. it's not you know, the color is slightly different, but it's because of that reflection and we're seeing that separation. Um, and again, it's just um, amazing how that that lens renders and uh, it's always fun to, <laughs> to shoot a track day. Uh, here, landscape in Maine, uh, and then just going in to crop in to show that, again, the sharpness and detail and a lot of lobster pots uh, that appear to be empty. But uh, again, great great color. We're not seeing casting. And again, it was kind of a, a grayish uh, overcast kind of day, yet the color still still pops. Um, mm -hmm. And you still have a lot of detail uh, and sharpness there. Um, yeah, here with the uh, Dachshund. And uh, again, with the 90, just the ability to record detail and color accuracy where you know, um, the dog's name is Blue, and he is <laughs> has some blue blue there. Uh, and it's uh, it's always interesting to me when we're looking at uh, something like this where there's different uh, different colors, but also the textures, and mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of detail, a lot of sharpness. 
I can even see myself in the reflection of the dog's eye. I was going to say that. Yeah. Um, Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's again, really impressive, um, to, to shoot those, those lenses here. Um, uh, you know, working with a model, I find, um, for, uh, that the lens is is very true. You get a lot of great, accurate uh, skin tone and color rendition. Um, and again, showing a, a lot of detail, um, you know, if that's what you want to show. Uh, and it's uh, it can be a challenge shooting portraits with this lens because it is a very, uh, a very true lens. But to me, the, uh, the way it renders skin tone and you get the separation to get, uh, you know, as much detail as you want. It's, um, it's, uh, it's great. They're great for, for portraiture, uh, here with, uh, kind of a landscape with the 75, just showing the detail, uh, here at the cherry blossom festival. Uh, to me, uh, again, that fall off that bokeh, yet yeah. being able to maintain that delicate color again, overcast, it seems like I shoot a lot in overcast bad weather. I, I think it's the Phil Penman syndrome uh, that I, <laughs> I'm currently suffering from. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, I love that shot, John. At the monument. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah I, I thought I would be the only uh, individual uh, and maybe a half hour or so before sunrise at the, at the Lincoln monument, but uh, I was incorrect. Um, there are a bunch of other people hanging around waiting for the sun to come up uh, behind uh, the Capitol and the Washington Monument. It's really a cool place to shoot early morning um, if you get a chance. Uh, and this was uh, early on with uh, with the SL2 uh, and that and that lens. So uh, a lot a lot of fun there. And here at uh, at the Jersey Shore down in Wildwood. And um, at uh, when they had the race, uh, the race of gentlemen there, and uh, I stumbled onto a, an antique uh, race car photo shoot with um, the Wildcat roller coaster behind it. I thought it was really just an amazing uh, place to to photograph old, older uh, vintage cars. But uh, is there anything that stands out to you about about this? You know, we have the detail. You know, we can see the brush strokes and and that. But uh, going back to the the regular yeah, shot, I, I think that for me, you know, as you zoomed into this particular image here, I, I was uh, I noticed the yellow posts mm -hmm. right that are out yeah. of focus in the shot here, and um, for me, that yellow, that shade of yellow, is exactly the shade of yellow that you get with direct sunlight on this type of kind of industrial, uh, you know, looks like it's a, some sort of cover for, for the roller coaster there. Um, right. And again, I think it speaks to the realism. I mean, even things that are out of focus, the color is accurate. Um, right. And I think that that really helps with understanding the context of these images, um, you know, and offers a, just a, a high level of, of realism, uh, no matter where that component is in the image, whether it be out of focus or in focus or, in the foreground or in the background, um, you know, everything is, is accounted for here. Right. And this is, this is one of yours also with the 35 and we can zoom in. Yeah. This is, and uh, I'm just you know, struck by the color is yes. On point. Yes. Beautiful. It's, you know, we're, we're talking again around sunset. We're, we're having a little appetizer before dinner on the porch and, you know, usually that, you know, little uh, part of cream there on the plates uh, would be yellow or orange or not white. <laughs> and right. again, speaking to the accuracy of those colors, despite shooting in sunset, um, and, you know, very directional light and very intense light, um, you're, you're still getting that incredible color throughout the frame. It's and it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to to utilize, you know, especially something like food, for example, where the color needs to be correct for it to be realistic and, and desirable. Um, you know, that can be quite a challenge if, if the lens does, is not up for the challenge. Yeah. And I, I like the texture again in, yes. in every bit on all those subjects. It's just amazing with that, with that side light. 
Uh, here's another yes, with the 35. Again, another shot uh, in Seattle on overcast day. Uh, you're not the only one, John, that uh, <laughs> deals with Wait overcast. Wait a minute, it's overcast in Seattle? Is that is that something Sometimes. new? From time to time, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, you know, the sea of green in this image, I think, you know, speaks yeah. to just how much this lens is able to capture. But also, you know, despite the sea of green, the the post of, you know, the mm -hmm. that's supporting the house behind it uh, is perfectly white, as it should be in, on an overcast yeah. day. So... Uh, you know, again, we're not seeing any kind of that cast, that bleeding onto the other subjects, uh, which uh, is, uh, you know, really is something special and really helps, right. again, with, with the realism of the shot. Yeah, this was in uh, in Boston with uh, Kitar Bear. And just, again, the detail uh, and color accuracy, you know, you can tell it's a, it's a Brady jersey. So it was obviously a few years ago. Uh, and the red of the fire truck, uh, just um, really, uh, it, that was a fun event um, that we had Kitar Bear posing for us and photographing him. And um, here we have a close up of uh, with the 28, again, showing with the crop, the uh, just the amount of detail, sharpness, the texture, uh, side lit, very uh, natural, natural color. Um, so that's kind of the the science part of it. Now we're going to take a quick look at some of the art, and I know we're over. And thanks for for hanging out with us. This is uh, one of Nathan's shots. It's one of my favorite uh, images that he's captured. Uh, and to me, there, there's so much going on, uh, but it it takes a minute or two to figure it out. And that's what I really like is I like things that make me force me to look and study it so why don't you tell us a little bit about about the shot with the 135 yeah this is a shot with the m11 monochrome from a plane uh shooting down to what i believe was uh it's i think it actually was the ocean at the, at the time of of flight here and uh i'm seeing you know the sun reflecting directly onto the water and utilizing that as a compositional element to frame the boat that is, you know, sliding through my frame here. And, you know, what I really like is that you have the the highlight and the texture, uh, you know, on the left-hand side, and then kind of this, uh, you know, darker environments, uh, you know, on the right-hand side of of the frame where the boat is, is kind of just slashing through here. And, you know, for me, this speaks to the performance of the lens, as we talked about uh, in, in the science portion of, the, of our conversation, where you're getting this incredible performance not only in the center, but also in the edges of the frame. And this is very helpful when you do have this kind of like texture surrounding your subject, right? We have these, the, the, the ripples of, uh, of the waves here um, off the boat on, on the right-hand side of the image. And they're just all clearly defined. It really helps with uh, the kind of abstract nature and the geometric nature as well of, of the shots. Uh, you know, John, we were talking about there's some images that uh, you know what they're going to look like when uh, when you're shooting them. And then there's some images where you're not quite sure until you start editing them. And this was definitely one of those shots where I wasn't quite sure what it was going to look like uh, until I, I, I blew it up on, on my screen. And that's yeah. when you can really like, okay, let's let's get into this file. Let's start to extract the qualities of the, of the texture elements of the highlights of the shadows. To, to really deliver on um, the vision uh, that I originally had when I was shooting, but again, wasn't quite sure of the final output right. until I actually saw it on my screen. That's great. I, I like the yin and yang of it and the diagonals um, yes. kind of conflict. It's very, it's beautiful, just beautiful. Um, so here are a couple of, uh, excuse me, a couple of portraits. Um, Again, uh, Karsh in influenced lighting, I'm guessing. Very uh, much so, yes. It's really neat. Yeah, really big, neat. Big fan of Karsh. Yes, I love I yeah. love his work. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, using different uh, techniques to to emphasize the image, using geometry, using texture, uh, utilizing, you know, this uh, element in the foreground to, to cover, uh, you know, half of my subject. But if you look closely on that right-hand image of, uh, of this uh, woman here, <laughs> Um, you can still see the outline of her head through this uh, this foreground 
kind of mesh that we're seeing. And uh, right. I think again, it speaks to the testament of this lens is able to record, uh, you know, a, a contrast level maybe so low that uh, I don't know, maybe other lenses might not be able to see, but I was able to extract that from the raw file uh, with the ability of, of this lens here. And that was, that was really fun to do. Yeah, here's a, a couple images again, just kind of showing that the same kind of the, the same principle where we're looking at higher contrast. Um, so one of a uh, like a store display, uh, kind of like something that maybe Alan Schaller would do. Uh, but uh, when I saw it in uh, in Little Havana, the, I saw that the hat and the dress in the window and how it was lit, and I I knew I just had to try and capture it and then working with a model uh, just with a little window light and kind of adding some mystery yet seeing plenty of detail uh, in hair and skin and it's um, again it's one of those things where you're trying to push a lens and see what you can do in either a harsh uh, lighting environment or high contrast lighting situation and even though these lenses have height and contrast they still hold detail uh, when you shoot a subject that is high contrast, which to me is is very fascinating um, as we're shooting. Here, another uh, another shot uh, in Little Havana of uh, a drummer who's lit by the stage, yet I'm seeing the, the light from the building, the reflection of the light from the building kind of behind mm -hmm. me and kind of making this uh, montage, yet the... The drummer is one in one color light, yet that's not being influenced. That light is not influencing the reflection. Uh, right. And that's, for me, uh, extremely important because that's this is how I saw the image. I didn't see it, you know, all casting purple. Uh, you know, I saw the drummer that way and I saw the reflection that way. And I think partly that's what uh, drew me to, to, capture, to capture the image. Again, it's... Uh, you know, I, I like working with reflections a lot and trying to to make uh, make images that are uh, more layered, but also more more interesting that you have to think a little bit about um, as you cover. Now, this is one of yours. Uh, and again, I, I love this image because of how shallow the depth of field is. And you really get an idea of how that lens renders uh, going mm. to and away from the point of point of focus and the use of low light uh the color is spot on um what, what yeah, made you I, take this shot you know I, were you looking at a proof of performance scenario or something just attracted I, you I, I i wasn't i i, I really love the the painterly nature of the in focus and out of focus areas and and that was really for me mm -hmm. kind of subject matter itself i'm not really focusing on anything particular other than the sand but i like the symmetry of the out of focus areas and the in focus areas and i think that the symmetry mm -hmm. only really works because of the quality of the background blur but also the quality of the foreground blur the foreground blur is not mm -hmm. less you know desirable than the background blur right. and i think that. Um, you know, it speaks to the performance of of these lenses and the engineer that goes into it to make that happen. Uh, but uh, yes, the foreground can be just as important as the background, and that bokeh is uh, you know mimicked throughout uh, those two parts of of the image. There, um, this is a, another shot with the ninety uh, here in Seattle uh, at Discovery Park, and. Uh, you know, if you uh, have ever experienced uh, our, our stormy seasons here in the Pacific Northwest, you get this kind of very beautiful, dark blue glow, uh, especially in the mm. evenings. And it's just, uh, it has got a very certain mood to it. And, you know, the fog starts to sit in. And, you know, in this case, we had this big tanker boat behind uh, the, uh, the lighthouse and uh, just helped with uh, the overall mood of the shot. You can even see, though, the reflection of you know that top part of the of the lighthouse, the light coming out of the lighthouse right. onto the puddles. So there's just you know some of these elements when you're when you're in this environment when it's raining or it's about to rain and you're kind of concerned about trying to get back home and is it time for dinner? But you know when you look back out, you're like this is this is great. There's so many little secrets. There's so many little things that I 
might have missed because I was trying to right. get the shot. And then when you're back at home looking at these files, these lenses just provide so much information everywhere as far as the color and the contrast and the, how everything renders. Uh, you know, you get to kind of re-experience these moments that you had when you shot these. And it's not like you can't remember them. It's really like, oh, I know exactly how that was. I, I remember, the, you right. know, how cold I was <laughs> when I shot this image <laughs> because, you know, it, it just fits uh, exactly the, the colors that I saw when I was shooting it. So it just, right. uh, it's just fantastic. No, I, I think the, the color palette is very delicate. And that really adds to the mood and the emotion of the image. Um, and that's something that, you know, an, an Apo lens brings to the equation. It's not always recording that bright blue sky or that red strawberry. It's right. also about recording the delicate nature of color and how mm. color creates a mood. And that's really what we're what we're seeing here um kind of same same here um, right again a great a great landscape uh, and utilizing the fog to kind of isolate subject but also kind of give that um better idea of depth right yes um, and again very delicate delicate uh color palette yet strong detail plenty of detail um in there um absolutely this is another great great shot um again really showing the how the the bokeh renders uh where was this this was, was in uh new york in uh okay. in chinatown um this is a a shot i like to to show uh you know demonstrating what we've been talking about today with that control of contrast where a 35 f2 apple sumacron looks like or renders like a 1.4 lens and you know I, mm -hmm. I asked people and i show this image you know what aperture do you think this lens was shot at and people will say oh is this the the 0.95 is this the 1.4 right no this is the f2 um so <laughs> you know you you yeah. just have uh so much control over uh you know the depth of field just because of the control of, the, of contrast that the lens has um, but, you know, I love also the way that it renders the reflection of those bokeh lights onto, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, that kind of storefront Metal that we're gate. seeing right here that's closed. Yeah. Uh, and the orange and red that just kind of slides toward the viewer. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's really fun how, how the lens is able to accurately, you know, record that reflection off of that metal grate there. Yeah, that's great. Um, and this uh, this is my attempt at trying to make the lens flare, like shooting car headlights directly into car headlights uh, in street lights and no flare. An M lens, you'd get starbursts and all kinds of things. And yet uh, being able to use the, the steam in the lights to kind of isolate the photographer uh, in the foreground. Um, and yet everything stays together. You've got mixed lighting. Uh, yeah, yeah, you you still have the the steam is still white, yet yes. you can see areas of the street that have different color lights and the sidewalk hitting it. Yet it's not influencing that. So again, a real benefit with Aposumicron lenses uh, to do that. So we've reached the end of the images. So we want to thank everybody very much. Uh, let's have a quick look at what is next. So uh, we have Leica Academy workshops coming up, uh, Eating With Your Eyes with uh, Jim Sullivan, a food photography workshop in Seattle coming up. And if you want to scan the QR code or check out uh, LeicaCameraUSA.com slash academy, uh, you can go on and register for that class as well as an architecture workshop. So I don't know if they're going to do sunrise at the, uh, at the Lincoln okay. Memorial, but they might. Um, and that's, uh, October 20th, uh, to the 22nd. Uh, and again, you can register for that at, uh, on our website and then a workshop that I'm involved with, with, uh, with Toots, uh, the natural light portrait workshop. And this will be the third time that we're doing it. If you have any interest in learning from, uh, one of, uh, I feel one of the best who, uh, utilizes natural light for 
for fashion photography uh, and learning about working with a model uh, as well as working with uh, a team. It's a great workshop uh, to attend, a one-day workshop that'll be in uh, in New York, in Brooklyn, in Tuta Studio. And uh, it's always uh, a lot of fun uh, to be there. So that is it. If you want to follow us, here are our uh, Instagram handles. Uh, so please feel free to uh, follow us. And uh, we had a great time. I had a great time today talking with you, Nathan, about the art and science of Epo lenses, and um, I hope you had the same. So I, I could talk more, but uh, you <laughs> know we've already uh, gone past our, our time. Yeah, but gone, uh, I'm yeah. sure that we'll have more conversations in the future yeah. about Apple lenses. Uh, there's such yeah. a, a, a incredibly you know interesting part of the Leica lens lineup, and uh, really showcase. The you know the engineering prowess I would say of uh, of the brand and 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 the vision that the brand has right. when it comes to to building out optics. So it's it's definitely something that we're we're you know deep and uh, very interested in. And uh, um, yeah, looking forward to to speaking more about that uh, with you. Uh, I'm sure in the coming uh, coming weeks, coming months, coming years. All right. I'm sure it'll be a great time. All right. So thanks everybody for tuning in for everyone that stayed with us. And I uh, hope everyone has a great, uh, great weekend coming up and hopefully some great weather to go out and shoot in. So uh, until the next time, we wish you good light and have a great day. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.